Good evening. I'm calling this meeting to order. The time is 5.30 p.m. In accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Code, or Government Code, Chapter 551, this meeting is officially open with a quorum present. Uh, we were going to move on to agenda item number two, calling to order the public hearing to discuss the district's 2019 financial accountability rating. Uh, the public hearing to discuss this is uh, now called to order. So, Ms. Shiro, are you ready to give your report? Yes, uh, President Ramos, Dr. Scribner, and members of the board. Uh, tonight, we are holding our annual School First public hearing. It's providing to you and to the public our state financial accountability rating for the fiscal year ended June 30, 2018. The purpose of School First is accountability, uh, to disclose the quality of the district's financial management practices as we strive to put as many budgeted dollars in our classrooms. And so uh, uh, this year, as far as it, it, it's for the period ending June 30 of 18, there were 14 scored indicators uh, that generates a numerical score that ranges from zero to 100. So a district's financial rating is also a letter grade. It can be an A, B, C, or F, and it's numerically ranged as shown on this slide. And now I'll turn it over to David to go over uh, the next part of the presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, the first indicators are known as critical indicators, and they really have to do with the audit, the annual financial report. Uh, they want to make sure that you have a clean, unqualified, or now unmodified opinion and that there are no material weaknesses. Uh, they talk about compliance with debt covenant and timely payments uh, to the IRS and other government agencies. Uh, the solvency indicators, there are seven solvency indicators, and they really look at your overall financial health. They look at financial uh, ratios for educational industry standards and to see that you're within those parameters. Uh, we scored 66 out of 70 points on that one. And then the third category is financial competence uh, for a total of 30 points. We got all 30 points of those, and that is based on the data that we give to TEA on an annual basis. They want to make sure that it matches your annual financial report, uh, that your audit is free of material uh, noncompliance from grants, laws, et cetera. So uh, those are the three major areas that they assess. Um, then we proceed to the uh, first requirements that are legislatively mandated. Uh, Fort Worth ISD must announce and hold a public hearing within the first two months. We received uh, the financial ratings, the final ratings on 9-10, September 10th of 2019. We published in the Fort Worth Star Telegram as required by statute on October 2nd, and tonight we are holding the public hearing. Um, Fort Worth ISD must prepare and distribute an annual financial management report, and we've provided a copy of that to you. Uh, containing the financial report are a comparison line by line of the current year and the prior year indicators. Uh, there are also disclosures required by the uh, legislature, Title 19, Chapter 109. Uh, that report can also be viewed on the Fort Worth ISD website under the accounting page. Um, we are pleased to announce that uh, Fort Worth ISD received an A, 96 out of 100, with a superior achievement rating, and that's been uh, the history for the time presented. I think it's been that way for several years, obviously. So, uh, President Ramos, that it does conclude uh, our presentation on the public hearing this evening. Thank you. At this time, we will hear from those who requested to speak regarding the district's financial accountability rating. School first. Looks like we have no one that signed up to speak on this item. So this, the public hearing is now closed. Thank you. So now that the public hearing has concluded, we will be led into the Pledge of Allegiance by students from Alice uh, Contreras Elementary School, where Amelia Cortez Rangel is the principal. She will introduce her students in just a moment, but first let's please stand for the pledges. Flag. I pledge allegiance to the 
Thank you, President Ramos, members of the board, and Dr. Scribner. We have our wonderful students. I'm going to introduce them now. We have Michaela um, Zuniga, and her father is here, Mauricio Zuniga. We have Siglali Murillo, and her sister is here, Yuriti Murillo. And then we have Avion and Avani Kopervich, and we have parents here, Kendall and Rudy. And then we have um, Gage Beck and his little sister, Jada Beck. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, young people and the families, for being here tonight to lead us through the pledges. Next, Mr. Clint Bond from the Communications Department will make several introductions. Thank you, President Ramos. Our student greeters this evening are from the Army JROTC unit at South Hills High School, where uh, Rodrigo Durbin is the, the principal. Uh, I'll introduce the students. We'll have them all stand, and we'll thank them uh, when uh, we have them all standing. Battalion Commander Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Christina Flores. Battalion Executive Officer Major Brianna Garcia. Battalion Command Sergeant Major Samuel Gonzalez. Battalion Operations Officer, Cadet Captain Rosanna Estrada, and Battalion Public Affairs Officer, Cadet Captain Gabriela Medina. The Senior Army Instructor is CW3 Gilber uh, Chief Gilberto Grinald, and he's assisted by Army Instructor First Sergeant Michael Long, so let's thank them for being here this evening. This evening, we are recognizing Brett Helmer for his involvement at Monig Middle School. Could you stand, sir, please? Mr. Helmer currently has two students in the Arlington Heights High School Pyramid, a son at Heights and a daughter at Monig Middle School. Mr. Helmer has been an active participant in the Monig community for five years, and his dedication to the students in, our in that pyramid is unmatched. Some of the activities Mr. Helmer has been involved in include being an active member of the site-based decision-making committee. He was instrumental in securing $40,000 from private funders to bring communities and schools to Monic, which provides a full-time social worker to support our students. Coordinates one of the largest PTA fundraising activities of the year titled Mustang Madness, and it's a two-hour extravaganza that includes a soccer tournament, a basketball tournament, dodgeball, a DJ, snacks, and fun for all the students uh, before spring break. Although he hasn't uh, had a student attend the Leadership Academy at Como, he mentors and reads with a young man weekly as part of the Read Fort Worth campaign. He speaks fondly of this student with the Monig principal each time he sees her, and he's so excited about the progress of this student uh, has made in reading. He also drives the Stripling and Monig principals in the Arlington Heights Parade each year, in his friend's vintage Cadillac convertible. <laughs> Principal Dr. Kelly Kirkpatrick had this to say, Mr. Helmer is obviously very passionate about providing academic and enrichment opportunities for students in the Arlington Heights Pyramid. He is able to drum up support for any idea he has and is w always willing to lend a helping hand. Although his daughter is now an eighth grader, they hope to continue the relationship with Mr. Helmer even when his last student no, no longer graces the halls of Monic. So the Family Communication Department and the principal from Monic Middle School are honored to present Mr. Brett Helmer with a Certificate of Appreciation for Family Engagement. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Um, at this time, Trustee Toby Jackson will recognize Fort Worth After School in the United Way annual campaign, so I will turn it over to her. Thank you, President Ramos. We have a very nice opportunity this evening to represent FWAS, or Fort Worth After School. This is their 20th anniversary, and the formal presentation will take place this Thursday, October 24th, at 5 p.m. until 6 p.m. at Van Zant Gwynn. And we'll have quite a few special guests, but the most special guests will be the kids that benefit from after school each and every day with this amazing organization. I just want to highlight some of the key items in this proclamation that we'll present this evening that speak to the work this program's done 
for each of our students that participate. The proclamation says, whereas funding and collaboration are unique to Fort Worth and have been highlighted by the National League of Cities, notating over 200,000 students participating since October of 2000 and approximately 12,000 of those students participating three or more years with long-term student participants demonstrating higher proficiency in reading and math scores for school day grades and higher school and higher star scores but most importantly not one of these children that have been long-term in this program that have been followed have ever entered our Tarrant County juvenile probation system uh, they touch between four and five thousand kids a day every day they take care of them and they are on 77 different school sites whereas no long-term participant has ever been processed through Tarrant County Juvenile Services revealing students are making positive decisions I said that twice because that's hugely important and because I jumped ahead uh, whereas Fort Worth After School has provided more than 600,000 full dinner meals for participants since the 2017-18 school year, helping address food deprivation in areas of Fort Worth. I want to ask if Miguel Garcia would come down and introduce his team and just say a couple of words. And I'd just like to ask if the team could come down too with him, please. Thank you, Toby. Dr. Scribner, President Ramos, thank you for having us tonight. Um, this is my central team. This is uh, Tamar Gully, Charlize Thomas James, Dennis Duncans, and Gary Stoles. And they help oversee the 77 sites that we've been assigned to and that we, are, we have the pleasure of, of overseeing. Um, I, I, I said I would keep, and I know you said keep your remarks brief, and I, I will because uh, a couple of different reasons. One, um, prior to coming in here, my, my teenage girls called me and said, uh, by the way, dude, we are hungry, so keep your comments short. We know you can be, we know you can talk. So, bro, we're hungry. Keep it short. And last night, when I was reviewing some notes with my with my wife, she said, um, "That's a bit, dude. You're not at you're not at the Apollo, okay? So don't do that. Don't show those notes." And I said, "Okay." But finally, I know that I've been here enough times to know that Clint Bond will make sure that I don't go over. See, he's not even paying attention. But truly, we want. I know I'm afraid of him going time. Um, <laughs> So I'll, I'll keep it short. But truly, we want to thank you all for your support over the last... There you go. <laughs> well played. I disagree because you highlighted my remarks and they were short, and so I'm going to give you my time. No, oh, I, I don't need all that time. I'd just like to say thank you for supporting us for the last 20 years. We look forward to at least another 20 years. I know I won't be in the role. This morning, Charlize said, no dice. We were at the Tarrant <laughs> County Commissioner's Court, and so... It might be left up to these three, but um, we truly appreciate your support, and we've seen some re really positive results from our program. Um, we know that we can do a lot more, and we're trying to do a lot more every year. We're trying to um, improve the program every year. We never rest, and there's no sacred cows in our program. If something's not working, then we just go ahead and, and, and we, we release that program. And so um, I want to say thank you to Alice Contreras. They're actually going to be there on Thursday night. The cheerleaders are going to be there welcoming guests, so... We'll see you all again, some of you all probably on Thursday night, so thank you. Um, but, yes, we have seen great results, student results. Um, and just as an FYI, we have put a very um, rote dashboard up on our windows right now. We're going to improve it, um, but it's got some did you know points for Fort Worth After School. One of the things we're very proud of is we are addressing the food deserts in Fort Worth right now with the help of the city of Fort Worth. Um, we're going to have 80 sites next year that we feed. For, that's 80 Fort Worth ISD schools only. That's not including the 14 community centers. We anticipate that we're going to serve about 800,000 full dinners next year to our students in Fort Worth ISD. And we know that's a citywide. Yeah. Just, and just a, a, a point, um, for every principal, we've, we've reminded them, this is not just for your Fort Worth after school students. Any school that provides full dinners, those principals are able to bring any student who attends his or her school back to the school to enjoy those dinners. And so we're not limiting it to Fort Worth after school students. And so we appreciate your support. We do ask if you are coming on Thursday, just let us know. We'd love to have you on Thursday at Van Zandt Gwynn. We're going to have some student entertainment, um, but we have a lot of folks out there who want to talk. And so we're going to let them talk. And then we're going to have, it might be an epic failure. We're going to see. We were supposed to help light up Will Rogers Tower 
On the 24th, it was supposed to be ready. It's not. That's okay. So we're going to have 100 LED or 100 cupcakes that are wrapped in LED lights um, provided to us by Loft 22, who was in the Cupcake Wars and Cake Wars. And so she's providing the cupcakes. So we're going to try to light up the Fort Worth after school cake. It, like I said, it could be an epic failure. We're going to see. But at least the cupcakes will be good, and we'll enjoy those. So we invite you to come join us on Thursday night. And those of you in the audience, if you have time, please feel free to join us on Thursday night at Van Zandt Gwent from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. And I know we've, we've played around with Clint Bond tonight and joked about him, but, Clint, you do a great job, and your team... Barbara, thank you all so much. The signs look great at Clark and Farrington, and want to thank you for advertising this. Two decades is a huge, huge, huge uh, milestone for this group. Let's give them one more hand. <laughs> this evening also affords another great opportunity to recognize the wonderful work of our United Way of Tarrant County. Last year, this district, Fort Worth ISD, received $753,560 in grants from the United Way of Tarrant County to support childhood literacy programs and secondary initiatives that prepare students for college and careers. United Way also employs strategies throughout the community that help families achieve financial stability, address health concerns, and send children to school with the emotional and material support that allows them to thrive. October 15th was the Fort Worth ISD United Way campaign kickoff, and the campaign runs from October 21st through November 1st, so you still have time. We want to take this time to let you know how much we appreciate you and the campaign and your efforts. I also want to acknowledge uh, T.D. Smyers, CEO, is here, and I'd like to, if you would, come down with your team and say a few words, and thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Toby. President Ramos, Dr. Scribner, it is an honor for me to be here today, um, and it is my honor to serve this community as the President and CEO of your United Way of Tarrant County. Um, with me are Crystal Arzik, where'd Chris go? He's the tall one. Uh, Ken Anderson and the uh, prolific Dr. Faye Ballou, uh, who everybody knows. She's actually cloned. She's in six places tonight. This is one of them. So, the, um, as you know, Doctor, we've talked about this a lot. Um, we have spent the last four years retooling United Way in Tarrant County so that it can be a real true partner in finding the root causes of social determinants of success in our communities, primarily with our children. And we've retooled that in a way that enables every individual giver to know that 100% of what they donate through the United Way campaign goes exactly where they tell us it goes, whether that's to a designated cause or a designated agency or into the United Way's community fund that's competitively allocated every year, judged by a group of volunteers. We think this is powerful, and we think our focus on systemic change has a direct correlation with partnership with this body and with the ISD, specifically in terms of key issues currently, like third grade reading readiness, but also cradle to career readiness across the board as we start homing in on systems and what the root causes are that prevent kids from getting there. I'm really excited about where we've gotten, but I'm even more excited about what's coming because we've gotten to a great place. And it is, a, it is an operational partnership for sure, as Toby highlighted, with the grants that United Way has made directly to the ISD programming. But it's also a resourcing partnership, and that's why we ask for your participation in the campaign. This is Team Ball, and that campaign is fueled by people that come to work every day and want a little bit of, of their paycheck to go to making this community a better place. They're philanthropists. Every single one of you that participates in this campaign is a philanthropist, and that's what we call you and recognize you as that. So it's a true partnership. We do invite everybody to, to participate and donate through your retooled, reinvented United Way on behalf of all the kids that this body serves. And as I close, let me just say that I am really proud as I sit here uh, waiting for my turn to come up here to see leaders that have committed their lives and their passions like all of you sitting up on this dais, like my friend Brett Helmer, um, and uh, participate in this with you all as a partnership. So thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. I do want to recognize Dr. Faye Ballou, HEB trustee in the room. And with that, it's a good transition from one trustee to 
a former trust, couple of former trustees with uh, Jesse in the audience, and also uh, to move over to Dr. Rudy Rodriguez, uh, who, who thank you very much for reaching out with the next recognition that we're about to do. So this year we are celebrating 50 years of bilingual education in Fort Worth ISD. In 1969, Dr. Rudy Rodriguez helped create Fort Worth ISD's first bilingual education program in eight schools. Fort Worth ISD's first bilingual educators gave their energy, professional talent, and unfailing commitment to make the impossible possible. They focused on creating a well-organized, credible, culturally empowering learning experience for Fort Worth ISD's language um, children. Bilingual teachers emphasize culturally relevant experiences, even more specifically for Mexican American students, such as the use of the children's dominant language and in instruction in dances common to different Mexican regions, while also encouraging cafeterias add traditional Mexican dishes to the lunch menus. This 50th anniversary allows us to honor Fort Worth ISD's commitment to and role as a pioneer in North Texas and those such as Dr. Rodriguez, who paved the way. Thank you all for your past and present services to our students. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Rodriguez, Minerva Serrano, and Jolinda Martinez to have a presentation for us. support. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, President uh, Ramos, and thank you, Dr. Scrivener, and, and um, thank you, board members, for this opportunity, you know, to address the group. Uh, yes, this is the 50th anniversary of uh, bilingual education in Fort Worth. You know, the earlier speakers talk about 20 years, 25 years, well, how about 50 years? <laughs> and, um, and yes, the, this group, the uh, group that uh, made it possible you know, for Fort Worth to have the successful program that it's had over all these years, you know, that could be attributed to the, you know, the uh, and I like the word passion. One of you mentioned passion. I think it was you, Ms. Jackson. You know, the passion, the hard work, y mucho corazón, you know, that was invested, you know, in this um, uh, development of the original bilingual education program, and uh, it was implemented in the fall of 1969. You know, a tribute also to your predecessors, you know, uh, um, Dr. Scribner, it was Dr. Trulson, Julius Trulson, who was superintendent at the time. And uh, we had a very supportive board, uh, just as you've been supportive of the bilingual program here in, in uh, Fort Worth. And it, is, it was their foresight. It was their good judgment, you know, that led to the development of the first uh, federal grant, which was approved by the uh, U.S. Department of Education at the time, that made it possible for us to f fund the original program here in Fort Worth. The first in North Texas, by the way, uh, although um, some might argue that, but it was the first program in Fort Worth and later uh, paved the way, you know, for those um, directors that followed, hopefully, you know, they built the foundation, you know, which uh, um, created the, uh, the outstanding programs that followed all the way through uh, the uh, previous director, Mr. Uh, Vasquez, and now the, the excellent person that you have brought on board as the executive director for bilingual education, Ms. Um, Clarice Rangel. So congratulate her, and thank you also for the good work of Mr. Vasquez. Mr. Vasquez was the first one to invite us to a um, workshop of his teachers on uh, September the, um, or was it August the 7th, and uh, where he uh, had our group uh, at that meeting and uh, gave us full recognition and honored us for the uh, the good work that uh, and the foundation that we built back in 69. And um, so uh, I, I know that the time is limited, and, you know, I, I was al alerted of your time limitations uh, by Ms. Molinar, <laughs> but wouldn't it be a, uh, appropriate, uh, it would be appropriate, um, uh, President Ramos and uh, Superintendent uh, Scribner, to recognize some of these good people, and they're here. And uh, it was their hard work. Um, their mucho corazón, you know, that made it possible for us to have this uh, outstanding program that uh, has evolved over the years here in Fort Worth ISD. 
And uh, so I'm going to ask those people that were part of that original program, who are the teachers and uh, part of the staff um, that created, uh, that built that foundation. So will you please stand, por favorcito? Yeah. Ms. Reid was at Helping Elementary uh, School as a teacher with, with the late um, Elizabeth Hill, uh, Elizabeth Overstreet. And um, let's see, Joe Linda, you know, she was, uh, you're, gonna, you're here for Joe Linda, the good work she did in the outreach parent involvement program, the community outreach, community involvement program. And um, she was with us at the beginning. These are, uh, as is Minerva Serrano, live um, residents of, um, of uh, Fort Worth. And, uh, so they uh, shared a lot of great experiences and their knowledge of the community made it possible for us to really um, garner, you know, the, the support of the community during those early years. Uh, Guillermo Morales over there, uh, she also was involved very actively and, and during those early years. And uh, uh, Tony, Antonio Morales, uh, you know, is a community uh, uh, advocate and did so much through his through the American GI Forum and others. So he was one of many community-based people, you know, that help, uh, you know, strengthen that uh, community support. This is Jesse Martinez and let's see Mauro Serrano, you know. Uh, so all these people, in one way or another, you know, made us pos made it possible for us to have the outstanding program uh, that we had back in 1969. And uh, I could talk forever. But, uh, you know, there's been a few celebrations, so I appreciate what Mr. Vasquez did back and his staff and Lily Valu, uh, you know, in, in, in the uh, uh, workshop that, uh, you know, in conjunction with the workshop. They recognized our group at that time, in uh, August the 7th. I hope I've got that right, Mr. Vasquez, it was the 7th. And then um, I, I was joined by my colleagues from the 1969 team of outstanding professionals in a beautiful program the, uh, celebrating our anniversary, our golden anniversary, that uh, was organized by the uh, Hispanic Heritage History Project, led by uh, Ms. Rosalinda Escobar Martinez. And you want to stand over there, Rosalinda? Thank you so much for that beautiful celebration over it that uh, was held at the uh, at the public library. So now, you know, we were wanting to make you guys part of that celebration. Thank you so much for those kind words, uh, President uh, Ramos, uh, about our program. It's, uh, I think it brings honor to all of us, so we appreciate that. By the way, we were just a few years beyond the teenage year. This is why we were very young. This is why many of us are still around. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, some of the challenges you know we had during those early years, and uh, which we transformed into opportunities. And uh, so, I'm going to have first uh, Minerva, who was a classroom teacher. You know, this is where it's at, right. where we created the, the changes, the transformations that were so essential to the Fort Worth ISD at the time. So I'm going to have Minerva come and speak to you first, Minerva Serrano, and then she will be followed by Jolinda uh, Martinez, who uh, did a heck of a lot of work together with the other community agents of the program, you know, to strengthen that community support for the program because it was spanking you not only for the Fort Worth ISD, but the community as a whole. Minerva. I think we're almost to our five minutes. Well, <laughs> anyway. I'm on the extension, Ms. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're not going to take that long. We've practiced really hard. If, if we speak freely, we will take a lot of time, so I'm going to try to stick to this. Um, President Ramos and Superintendent Scribner and members of the board, it is an honor to be here, and I'm going to give you the perspective of a teacher at that time. Um, I overheard that um, Maria Thibodeau also was 21 when we both started, and it's been 50 years, so I think we've, we're still young, but old young. <laughs> so, but we are so honored to be here, because this is where it all started, Fort Worth ISD for us. Um, when I started, I was assigned my first year, the second semester, um, for a teacher that went, um, that left the school, and I was there for the spring. And I was so excited, like many of the 21-year-olds, we had learned all this wonderful book stuff, and then we got in, and we didn't know that we had 
curriculum in English, we didn't have anything in Spanish. And it's like, okay, so we're going to be translating all of this because we called Rudy and we, Dr. Dr. Rodriguez in and we said, uh, what do we do? And of course, he was working frantically trying to get groups together and whatever and monies with a school board that was wonderful to us and the superintendent then. And so um, we decided to do a lot of translation. However, Rudy didn't say there was just a few in each school, and there were only, how many schools did we start with? We started out with um, seven, and later we added uh, MGLs. Okay. And I started at Nash one year, and then I moved to MGLs uh, at that time. And then from then on, I was with kindergarten. That was my love for a long time. And uh, we spent a lot of hours translating, and we didn't know that that was not normal. So, and we didn't know that you don't get paid for that, but we'd never expected payment. I hear now that when you do extra things, you get paid. But in those days, we didn't get paid, so we were there <laughs> on Sunday, <laughs> Saturdays and Sundays translating and translating because I did not speak Spanish until I went to college. My parents spoke Spanish. They were born here. And many uh, teachers I heard went through the same thing. Their parents suffered when they were here. So they said, none of our six kids are going to speak Spanish at home. They're going to learn English. And then we had to learn it in college. But I had heard it, so it makes a difference when you hear it. So I tried to uh, do the very best. But then we were very fortunate. A few later, years later, not that long, uh, Rudy was able to get a group called Becca. And they were a lot of the teachers from South Texas that had spoken Spanish all their life. And they wanted to also be teachers. And with their energy and our energy, we uh, started working with other school districts and other people, and we started getting a curriculum that helped. So a long story short, uh, we had my class, my first few, from then on, I had African-American, Anglo, and uh, Spanish-speaking students that were Hispanic. But they weren't all from Texas. They were from all over Texas, all over Mexico and other countries that spoke Spanish. And when we were translating, we were hitting a wall. When you said something, you thought you had a wonderful lesson plan, you knew how to do the English, and then the Spanish, I don't know what you're talking about, they would tell you in Spanish. We realized that a lot of the words are so different in different um, uh, Spanish groups. So that was another headache. So we had a lot of things to look forward to. But you know, we were so young and we didn't care. We just thought, oh, we're teaching and making a difference. And we had children and we would put them to sleep and we were still translating. And it took a few years, but we got some Spanish books and they kept improving. And I do um, want to tell you, we did have challenges. And let me wrap it up real quick because Jolinda needs to talk. But um, when we had the challenges of trying to figure out how to work with the children, the children that were in there that didn't speak Spanish wound up being in our programs. They could speak speak the songs and, and the nursery rhymes and everything that we were teaching. Our, our Spanish students were learning English so quick, quickly. And you know kindergarten, they catch on very fast. And I had an African-American child my first year that he could sing any of little Joe's songs for the program. <laughs> he was just wonderful, and I was just so impressed. I'll always remember Giovanna. I wish I could remember his last name. I've met too many children since then. I do, however, want to stop and say, even though we had challenges, we, like Rudy, Doc, Dr. Rodriguez said, we just went face head on and didn't realize that that was that type of a challenge and there was that everybody in the world was not suffering through the same thing that we were going through. But you have heard our challenges, but I do want to thank the school board, the community, and the staff teachers all over and boys and girls that are in our classrooms. Thank you for allowing so many wonderful programs to go on, especially our bilingual program. And um, bilingual department, que onda, we're so proud of you. I don't know if any of you are here, but we're very proud of you. Thank you again for giving me this opportunity to tell you how much fun it was being a first year teacher in bilingual. Okay. <clears throat> President Ramos, Superintendent Scribner, members of the board, I reiterate that we're very honored to be here and appreciate uh, you recognizing us. I am very excited to hear that we're, I'm kind of glad that we were last because I'm excited to hear all the things that have been going on and how the community is being involved. That was my charge when I started as community agent was to get the community involved and 
particularly the parents. And you can imagine, parents who didn't speak English didn't often feel welcome in the schools in, in those first years. And so I, would, I went knocking on doors, bringing the parents in. I'd meet with teachers to see, okay, what is it that you would like for the parents to do? And we did just all sorts of things. And like uh, Minerva said, uh, we didn't know that um, you you had to that it was uh, wasn't okay to work and work and work, <laughs> but we met with the parents, we met with the teachers, and together we planned uh, workshops. They would come in and help in the classrooms. They would come in and read to the students in Spanish. Uh, they would come in and help translate for those teachers who, there, of course, there weren't enough bilingual teachers, so many of them uh, could not uh, speak to the uh, needed translators when, when teaching the children, so parents would sometimes come in as translators. But the big thing was that we always did something that was involving them in, in engaging the parents. They were feeling very much a part of the school. They were helping the children feel proud of their culture because every year we had a big program that uh, at Will Rogers Auditorium that would bring students from all of the schools. We would fill the auditorium and they would have some kind of presentation of their culture or things that they had learned in the classroom. This was very important to me because I carried the parental involvement component in everything I did. I, I was with the district for 30 years and I was able to work very closely with parents. And the thing I'm the most proud of, I guess, is the uh, Hispanic Youth Promoting Excellence that uh, we had for 14, 14 or 15 years in the school. But it brought in uh, Hispanic students through Hispanic literature and really introduced many of them to uh, a, a lot more to their culture and I mean they some of them were connected to reading that didn't like to read before and most we continued working with them until they went into college and so we have many of the graduates that from the program they would be with us from eighth grade all the way through college and many of them were with uh, are now in in professions uh, that we would all be proud of their their uh, doctors forensics uh, uh, pe uh, for the forensics pathologists, their um, nutritionists, their you know just every every uh, vocation you can think of, but they're they're very successful. And if we had invited them, they would have filled this this room also. And a few of you, I see you, uh, Mr. Robbins, you were a big a big supporter of of that program, but. All this because of the community involvement, and I am very happy to see that Fort Worth ISD is still uh, doing a lot with, with uh, and bringing in more, more and more programs to, to bring the community together. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Ramos. And uh, before before President Ramos wrap, wraps wraps it up, I just wanted to say do, that um, uh, I wanted to thank Dr. Rodriguez uh, for being a pioneer uh, today in Fort Worth ISD. Uh, we have 43,000 students whose home language is not English. 4,000 of those students speak any one of 50 languages, and 39,000 students in Fort Worth ISD come from homes where Spanish is the primary language. Uh, we uh, soon will be uh, a, a, a community where the majority of the students are bilingual because speaking more two languages is an advantage. We want our, all of our students, we want 85,000 of our students to speak two languages. And we, I hear that from, from all parts of the city. Another interesting um, point uh, our staff uh, shared with me this last summer was that two-thirds of our uh, valedictorians and salutatorians, two-thirds of them were former English language learners. So the program that you pioneered works, and I want to thank... <clears throat> and I want to thank all of you, including uh, friends and family and my 
across the street neighbor, Maria Tubido, who makes, <laughs> sometimes texts me when the, when the little guy leaves the garage door open. <laughs> so thank you for that. I'll turn it back over to President Ramos. <laughs> yeah, she can. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's a good transition for me to recognize beginning with, go ahead, Rosalina. We just have a small token of appreciation from the Hispanic Heritage History Project for President Ramos and Dr. Scribner for all your support. Thank you very much. And uh, President Ramos was, Ramos was a part of our committee. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you, Rosalina and Arturo. I got to recognize your other half as well and the family for being extreme extremely involved in the community and bringing this to our attention, uh, making sure that, that respect was given to uh, the, the pillars and the leaders in our community. And so I want to begin first uh, noting that Dr. Rudy and Rosemary Rodriguez, there is a school named after them in, in Denton ISD. And so Mr. Rodriguez, Dr. Rodriguez uh, actually served a number of years in Denton ISD as a school board trustee. And so for you, sir, I want to, I want to give you a lot of gratitude that the second I got elected, uh, people within this sphere connected you and I. And the first time that we sat down, uh, you, you, you very consciously and very intentionally invested in me with asking for nothing in return other than making sure that we serve this community the way it deserved to be served. And so getting to the 50-year mark, I think that it is no accident that uh, I have the privilege and the opportunity to sit in this seat uh, with, with this level of influence with amazing colleagues, a team of, of, of soon to be 10, right? Um, so I don't take that for granted uh, and I appreciate you and, and your level of investment from day one. Uh, two, I wanna also acknowledge and recognize this team for even uh, by way of your influences of educating me as, as a first generation Mexican American student and, and growing up in Fort Worth, Texas, of even understanding who Alice Contreras was, the students who sit in the audience, that I had no idea, no concept, because there was that gap between what you all were doing and what I was hoping to do. Uh, and then that leads me to the great uh, Mrs. Jolinda Martinez, who for sure two of us, Quentin Phillips and myself, had the privilege and the honor of serving with you at Camp Anytown which is now known as Camp Community, where you invested in so many of us to do the work uh, unapologetically and with a lot of love. And then, of course, uh, Mr. Jesse, I'm not going to let you out. I'm not going to leave you out of it, sir, because this is a previous school board trustee here in Fort Worth Independent School District. Thank you for your years, years of service and the role that you played. And then that leads me also back to Ms. Jolinda again with what you mentioned, hype, Hispanic youth promote, promoting excellence. That was my first time to witness brown children in Fort Worth, Texas, that were rooted, knew who they were, knew what they were destined to do. And I cannot thank you enough for the work that you did for those many, many years, not only with the students, but also with the families in the community. And then I heard American GI Forum. I was an American GI Forum kid. And I cannot thank you for the work that you did, good sir. And, 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 and the value that that plays in the fiber of American society, that unfortunately till right now, not, not enough young people know about the history of American GI Forum and the reason why it was formed and the significance of it. And I promise you that this board is 100% committed by uh, redoing the Latinx history, African Africana history, so that that kind of history is not forgotten and that our children moving forward understand the sacrifices that you paid, good sir, for us to be able to do that work. And then the last one is a pitch from MACE, the Mexican American College Education Fund which Fort ISD has kind of seen move in different phases. And I think that this is a perfect opportunity for us as a district to get recommitted to ensuring that, as Dr. Scribner mentioned, what is a super majority of this district becomes serious about investing in our students to get them to that next level. Um, I cannot thank you enough. A lot of history in the room. I hope that everyone recognizes and acknowledges the work that you all did and pioneered in a time when it could not have been easy. And we cannot thank you enough. And for that, I think... We want to give you another round of applause. So my friends, this concludes the recognition portion of our meeting. We will take a short break so that our guests may depart if they so choose.
Thank you. We will be moving on to agenda item number seven, a presentation uh, school boundary community forum update by Dr. Scribner. I believe you're, are you ready, Dr. Scribner? I am. Thank you very much. And, and also, I'd like to thank uh, the trustees uh, who have participated in these forums thus far. I haven't hit all of the pyramids. We're just a little over halfway uh, through our 13 uh, high school pyramids. Uh, last night, in fact, we were at um, Diamond Hill High School. Next week, we'll be at Western Hills and Polytechnic High School uh, talking to the communities and listening uh, to our communities with regard to uh, our boundary conversation. Fort Worth ISD serves students across 209 square miles. And for those of the board members who have attended uh, the, the uh, forums, this will be a familiar presentation. But the board has done some very, very good things in, in specific areas, but we haven't taken a look at the comprehensive uh, boundary plan, a, a, a comprehensive analysis of all 13 of our feeder systems since 1999. And a lot has changed in Fort Worth over the last 20 years. We certainly have done uh, some quick fixes as a result of, of specific need um, at a uh, time certain uh, period. In 2009, made some changes to some middle schools, 2013 also, uh, middle and high schools. Uh, but what we really want to do is move in to the modern age. And I'm, I'm very, very pleased with, with, uh, with uh, the, the, the feedback and, 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 and questions that this board has, um, has presented me. Because what we're really trying to do here, when people say, uh, when, um, Superintendent, why are you doing this? Why are you looking at, uh, at boundaries? We're trying to fix a, a feeder pattern uh, that, quite frankly, is, is broken. I'll show you about that. And I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, for example, we have some schools that are overcrowded and less than a mile away, a school that is underutilized. What we're trying to do is balance that out because just like a classroom, we want to make sure schools are being, um, students are being uh, distributed and students are attending schools where they can get all of the resources and all the support that they need. Here's an example. One of the, one of the most egregious uh, examples that we're going to have to uh, address, and this is later on uh, uh, in, our, in our tour, closer to... Uh, to, to Thanksgiving, uh, we have three large high schools. Uh, we have Southwest High School, uh, S uh, South Hills High School, and Pascal High School. And if you look at South Hills and Southwest, you'll see uh, they're about the same in terms of their square footage, but South Hills has 2,100 students and Southwest has 1,300 students. And both principals in both school communities want to address that. So we're, we're going to meet with those communities and listen to them in terms of where they think uh, we ought to um, plan for boundary uh, changes. And we're going to be bringing those back to the board uh, next semester in one comprehensive plan. But there's more to this story. If you look at the middle school example, that's Rosemont Middle School. One middle school sends students to three different high schools. So students go to Rosemont Middle School, and when they are promoted from the eighth grade, some of them go to O.D. Wyatt, some of them go to South Hills High School, and others go to Pascal. Further, the Rosemont sixth grade center, and most districts don't have sixth grade centers. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The Rosemont sixth grade center, 100% of those students go to Rosemont Middle School. But if I, if the sixth grader uh, in, in, in a family who lived across the street from Rosemont Middle School, that sixth grader wouldn't go to Rosemont Middle School because Rosemont is not in the South Hills Pyramid. That student who lives across the street would get on a bus and go to McLean sixth grade. So that's something that we really want to fix and, uh, and bring, some, and bring some, um, some, some logic back to this system. 
The model pyramid is something that you, that you uh, probably recognize, uh, where we have a high school, a middle school or two, and then several elementaries, where a student will start in elementary and continue on with their cohort, with the neighborhood students, all the way through a high school. And why is this important? In a large city like Fort Worth, we're now, I think, the 12th largest city in the country uh, with uh, 209 square miles. Uh, school communities do better when there is a sense of community, when we can build smaller communities embedded into this large uh, metropolitan area. And we have 13 opportunities to create a pyramid whereby all students who live in that community go to school in that community throughout their pre-K-12 experience. Why is that important? Well, when we talk about alignment, we talk about having a clear focus and tighter alignment, alignment of academic program. If you have a great science program at the high school uh, level, then that, the, those, those teachers can work with the middle school teachers on down to the elementaries, whether it's academics, our, our, our specialized programs, or our extracurricular programs. Uh, we look at some of the, some of the groups that, that perform here. The high school choirs or the high school bands or the high school mariachis are very, very effective in those pyramids where there is a, a middle school program that's solid. The football coach at the high school can work with the football coaches at the middle school, can work with the PE teachers at the elementary. So what we're trying to create is a logical kind of nine small towns, excuse me, 13 small towns within a large um, uh, comprehensive uh, city. Here are examples uh, and across the city. So it's not just one side. It's not the north side. It's not the west Fort Worth. It's not east side. It's not, it's all over. It's not the south side. In each one of the regions, we have these elementary middle, middle splits where students go to an elementary school and some of my friends as an elementary student would go to that middle school and I would go to another middle school. We want to, we want to clean that up to the extent that's possible. So what are we doing? We're visiting with all of our school communities. We're listening, we're learning, so that we can lead. Fort Worth is unique. Fort Worth has six schools that serve just one grade level. We have six, excuse me, we have four, let me start over. We have four sixth grade centers. We have four schools that serve students in just one grade level, the sixth grade. We're the only uh, school district in Tarrant County that has multiple sixth grade centers. There's only one other district in Tarrant County that has a sixth grade center, and that's Everman. But we have four, and some of those um, have been struggling academically, and we want to take a look at that seriously, and perhaps if, does the configuration have an impact on that. There's a couple uh, decisions we can make. Uh, we can leave them alone and not change them at all and allow them to remain as sixth grade centers. Uh, we could push the sixth graders up into the middle school, which already exists in several of our pyramids, where we have sixth, seventh, and eighth grade middle schools. Or we could push the sixth graders down into the elementaries and have pre-K through sixth grade schools. These are the kinds of conversations I want to have because we are not making our decision at the beginning of the process. We're making our decision at the end of the process and then, pre and then presenting that um, for, for board vote. We also are, have reached out to the um, Texas Education Agency about the concept in some of these uh, sixth grade centers that are near their, 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 their um, partnering uh, seventh and eighth grade schools, if we could treat them as one campus on, on two, on, in two different buildings. And that, that's an that's a, a interesting, uh, intriguing idea that we're, that we're pursuing um, as we speak. So why would it make sense for us to, to have a more efficiently run um, uh, boundary system? Because you remember the, the values that, that, that we uh, focus on in public education are excellence. We want all of our students to achieve at the highest levels. Our equity, uh, not every student is starting the educational race at the educational starting line. And this board in Fort Worth ISD is actually isolated race. We focus on racial equity. Efficiency, we don't want to waste taxpayer money. We want to uh, make, make good, sound business decisions. And choice, we don't believe that schools should tell parents and students where they should go. We think parents and students should have the opportunity to choose as well. But we want to have great choice options embedded into each neighborhood. We want a quality seat for every student in every neighborhood. Some issues that have emerged thus far in our presentations. Uh, parents have told me, uh, we have great gold seal programs of choice, gold seal schools of choice in Fort Worth ISD, but my child didn't get in because there's a wait list. 
So I, as an educator, I think must ask the question, well, if we have a high-performing school that has 100 students on a wait list and another school that is underutilized, perhaps we could change boundaries and have two of those uh, high-demand choice schools. Why don't we have another Texas Academy of Biomedical Sciences? Why don't we have another uh, single-gender uh, men's leadership or women's leadership school? Why don't we have uh, other options like that? If we have great schools of choice and they're full, our goal is to eliminate wait lists and have all students who want to have a choice uh, uh, be able to a act on that. Further, the Montessori community that I've met with uh, last year indicated uh, Montessori and applied learning ends at eighth grade. There are, there's great research that the world, the problem solving, the critical thinking uh, uh, education uh, certainly can continue through the high school. So parents have asked me, can we create a pre-K-12 pipeline where we have perhaps a pre-K through fifth grade elementary program with no wait list? Perhaps, we, or, or more than one perhaps. Perhaps we have a 6th, 7th, and 8th grade uh, program. And perhaps we embed a high school program, a 9th through 12th program, into one of our comprehensive high schools where students will have the best of both worlds. They can go to a small specialized program, but then also benefit from the larger comprehensive high school where they can participate in extracurricular activities, be on the speech and debate team, be on the soccer team, uh, have those kinds of opportunities, the best of both worlds. Further, we have two schools that are in a shopping mall. We have two schools in the former Neiman Marcus uh, uh, building. And if we have two schools in, 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 in that building and we have other schools that are underutilized, um, uh, I want to ask uh, ourselves as professionals, uh, don't those students deserve a school building just like everyone else? Uh, we had a great success uh, over the last year or so with uh, World Languages Institute that was, that was in, a, in an office building on Magnolia, and now they are um, in the former Leonard Six, sixth grade building. Those are the kinds of uh, uh, ideas and conversations I think we need to have. Another interesting feature that I've heard from our parent community is there are some parents who say, you know, I really would prefer our students stay in the neighborhood from K through 8. Not every parent wants that, but some do, and I think we need to think about that. Uh, the, our our um, charter uh, schools in the, in the community, uh, some of them uh, are, are, are pre-K through 8, and, uh, and, and, I, and I think that our quali the quality of our teachers and the quality of our programs and the infrastructure that we have certainly can compete and, uh, and I would say outpace uh, the, the, the outcomes that, that's, that some of those charters are getting. I'm sure of that. So we asked our community at the end of each one of the forums for feedback. And I ask anyone uh, watching on TV or anyone here tonight um, if you would like to please uh, submit your ideas, your suggestions, your, your, your questions, your comments through our Let's Talk feature. It's on our website. Uh, you can find that at fwisd.org slash community forums. And uh, we have received a great deal of feedback thus far, and I'm sure as we continue with the second half of our tour, we'll get even more. Uh, parents really are, are, are engaged in community members. Uh, we have community members who don't have children in, in our schools who are showing up to these forums, and they too are participating. Here's what they've been saying thus far. 44% uh, 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 of them have questions. They want to know more information. That's what this is for. We can't be everywhere, so we're doing um, 13 of these, uh, these, these larger groups. And then when there are specific schools that will have uh, real tangible change, uh, we will be going out and having parent meetings with those affected schools. I, I have um, um, some uh, parents who have requested that already. For example, out in the Benbrook area, um, uh, Trustee Robbins has been very, very good to help facilitate that work with the, with the explosive growth there and the need for a new, a new elementary school. We're going to have to meet with that community and determine where the boundaries might go. Uh, we have uh, st uh, parents and, and community members uh, commenting, making suggestions, expressing concerns, and, uh, and although uh, boundary uh, changes are not the most popular thing, in fact, 6% of the people uh, think, uh, think uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a good thing. And, and I think at the end of the day, it's going to be the most responsible thing for us to do uh, moving forward. So uh, that's just a brief summary of what we've been doing. We'll continue to do that throughout throughout the fall through, thanks, through Thanksgiving and then, and then be coming back to the board spring semester after doing some more specific community work uh, with a recommendation that doesn't affect individual uh, 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 board districts but rather 
a one vote for the entire 209 square mile school district. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Scribner. Do we have questions or comments from the board on this presentation? Looks like Trustee Andar. Thank you, President Ramos, and thank you, Dr. Skinner, for that presentation. Just a quick question. Is there a way um, for us to be, or is it even necessary? I would, I'm curious about the feedback that we're receiving to just kind of have a better understanding of what the where the community is on, on this so that sure. we can um, j just be more informed and, and it's our job to be representing our constituents and to make sure that we know that where they're coming from and that we're representing them well. Absolutely. We, we certainly can forward that, that feedback um, to each one of the, 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 the trustees and, and, and we'll forward all of the feedback to all of the all of the trustees. Um, the, we, we made a strategic decision, which was we are posting each one of these presentations, and, and, and now that we're getting further into it, we are also presenting proposed maps, proposed fixes to some of these problems. And what we've decided to do is go out to the community, hold the meeting, hear the feedback, and then post the presentation um, on the website. Um, sometimes so if, 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 if posted ahead of time, we won't have the kind of turnout. And I think it's the rich discussion that allows us to listen, learn, and then leave. Thank you. Trustee Norman Robbins. Thank you, President Ramos. I would just like to thank Dr. Scribner and our staff for the way that this whole process has been handled. I don't recall, and I went on the board in 99, but I recall going to some of the meetings, and I think this has been much better structured, uh, has sincerely requested uh, thoughts, ideas on the issues, and so uh, willingness to, to meet as often as needed to, to make sure that things are properly uh, resolved. So I just want to thank you all. It's been a good experience. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robbins. It looks like that's all the comments or questions from the board. At this time, we will move to hear public comment. Let me remind you that because of the restrictions by the Texas Open Meetings Act, board members may not engage in a verbal exchange about a subject that has not been posted. We will listen and take notes, but the board is prohibited from responding to any inquiries made during a board meeting on any topic not posted on the agenda. However, the board may reply with one, a statement of specific factual information given in response to the inquiry to recitation of existing policy in response to the inquiry, or three, direct a person to visit with staff about the issue. While the board listens to concerns of a general nature and issues of common and individual concern, the board will not hear complaints about specific individual employees or public officers during the public comment session. Speakers shall refrain from mentioning names of individual employees or public officers during their comments. Any employee, parent, or other member of the public is asked to comply with the appropriate grievance policy to have a complaint heard pursuant to the applicable board policy. In accordance with board policy BED local, speakers shall have a three minute time limit and I ask that you please observe this rule. Furthermore, a speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another speaker. Delegations of five or more persons shall appoint one person to present their views before the board with the time not to exceed five minutes. Our first speaker for the night is Mr. Stephen Poole. Stephen Poole will be followed by, I believe it's Dave West. Good evening, uh, members of the board. Um, last week, we published our teacher salary comparison. This is the 27th year in a row that we've uh, done this comparison. And what we do is take 32 area school districts and uh, rank uh, teacher salaries at five-year intervals. And I wanted to show you, I was really excited to see this information, as, especially after House Bill 3 and how it affected employees. At year zero uh, for the bachelor's degree, Fort Worth ranked 17 out of 32 school districts. That's actually down seven spots from uh, last year. Uh, at year five, you're ranked eighth. That's up six spots. Year 10, you're fifth, ranked up, uh, moved up seven spots. Year 15th, you're fourth, and that's up four spots. Year 20, you're third out of 32, and that's up seven spots. Year 25, you're ranked uh, third, and that's up five spots. And at year 30, you're second, up two spots from there. 
This is fantastic news for Fort Worth ISD, and this is something you should be very proud of. This is not just a, the work of the state legislature and House Bill 3. Uh, the movement up the salary comparison is because of your commitment to add in additional local raises on top of the House Bill 3. This is excellent work. Uh, you know, the, the starting salary is something that always can be addressed next year to move you up in the ranks, but uh, this is something you should be very proud of, and I know the teachers and employees are very appreciative of the raises that uh, you gave this year. Uh, so we uh, send this out to over 60,000 public school employees, so this is also widely read, uh, people choosing, and we send them all to the College of Educations too. So people who are coming into the profession can make informed choices. Uh, for the first time, we ex expanded this uh, comparison, too. On our website, we have 48 school districts. We included the Dallas and Collin County uh, school districts in here. You, you compare very favorably all across the Metroplex with your raises, and this is something that we're going to have to uh, tend to every single year for many years to come for you all to be, uh, remain competitive. So great job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Poole. Next, we have Dave West. Dave West will be followed by Wanda McKinney. Keep my comments down to three minutes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Scribner, Mr. Ramos, board. Good evening. My name is Dave West. Um, I'm a concerned parent and community member of Eastern Hills High School, school zone. My concern persists in the fear of institutional racism, which lingers at Eastern Hills High School, despite the range of programs supported by the board. One in four children in Eastern Hills will drop out simply to inherit a life of low wages and poverty. This singular fact is disturbing. This perspective is built upon several dynamics. 94% of our student body are minority uh, ethnic group. 24% of the students will be dropping out of high school. A deplorable poverty exists in several of our neighborhoods in Eastern Hills School Zone. Eastern Hills is not dealing with the effects of poverty persistent in our student body. Staff have outdated approaches that are unconstructive and unengaging with students, which permit the dismissive acceptance of low-performing students or ethnic origin. The noise and yelling of staff in and out of the hallways uh, um, is a poor role model for the students, which is merely persistence with the ambiance of a ghetto school and does not train the students to appear to a new learned behavior. That no licensed mental health professionals present, full-time paid, our consultant, in a school with the magnitude of social and psychological issues in Eastern Hills. And there's a lack of equal resources compared to other high schools in this area. Complicating the learning environment in Eastern Hills is a plethora of violence persists. Police officers are even, are even assaulted on a regular basis. Children cannot learn in an environment uh, of violence and bullying. Fears and anxieties overwhelm the clairvoyance to learn as one must primarily think of protecting self. Maslow's hierarchy of needs speaks to this premise. The need for safety is second on the pyramid only after the physiological needs of breath, food, and drink. Overall, there's a stint of institutional racism, which can be defined as an adequate access to goods, services and opportunities upon an ethnic group. The Fort Worth Independent School District currently only proposes generalized programs like uh, curriculum, uh, cultural curriculum to address racism. So the solution requires a mammoth amount of staff and volunteer time coupled by leadership to build the solutions. Um, the path of solution requires assessing the individual needs, challenges and hopes including the home environment of the students, assessing the needs, challenges, and hopes of the teaching staff. Okay. Thank you, Mr. West. Thank you. Our final speaker for this evening is Wanda McKinney. Good evening, board. My name is Wanda McKinney. I'm a fourth ISD volunteer and a leadership ISD fellow. Last year, I accompanied the fifth grade students of Madre M. Walton, a predominantly African-American and Hispanic student body, to a Bass Hall production entitled Ellis Island, The Dream of America. 
After the show, I felt an uneasiness and almost queasiness as I looked around the hall of the students' faces, some of which were blank, and I wondered their thoughts. This year, I was asked again to chaperone, and I declined. This production depicts how people from white European countries, Belgium, Poland, Italy, Hungary, during the late 1800s to early 1900s, were fleeing war-torn, impoverished countries, seeking asylum in the United States, coming through New York, and were welcomed with open arms. More than 12 million plus European immigrants were welcomed in our, into our northern borders over a 60 year period. The ancestors of the students in the audience, 66% Hispanic, 23% African American, which is the makeup of Fort Worth ISD's student body, didn't know that dream. The African American ancestors came during the 1600s through mid 1800s, not on the deck of a ship, but in the belly of a ship, shackled and chained, stacked like sardines in a can for the same two month journey as the Europeans. They were welcomed with more shackles, chains, whips, and a price tag on their heads, enslaved, dehumanized, treated like property, young, snatched from their mothers for the next 200 years plus, and then came Jim Crow, and now new Jim Crow, which is disproportionate mass incarceration of African Americans and Latinos. African Americans, American students are still experiencing systemic, institutionalized racism and being left behind. Their coming to America's story is a nightmare, not a dream. The Hispanic students' ancestors came from war-torn, impoverished, corrupt government-ran countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, Ecuador, during the mid-1800s to mid-1900s, seeking asylum as well, came to the United States' southern borders, but were not met with open arms, but with vetting, rejection, and dehumanization. Returning to their countries wasn't an option. Therefore, they were forced into illegal immigration. Fast forward to now, almost 200 years later, they're still being rejected, housed in detention camps, and their children are being snatched from their mothers at the border. And after almost two years, some children still have, been, have not been re reunited with their parents. There are some Hispanic students in Fort Worth ISD who are fearful of going home, not knowing if one or both of their parents will be gone. Their coming to America's story is a nightmare, not a dream. In no way do I make light of the plight of the Europeans. However, I believe that continuing to show this to a student body, predominantly of color, further perpetuates the ideology that whites are superior, accepted, and privileged, and that people of color are inferior, rejected, and marginalized. Therefore, in the vein of a more racially equitable fourth ISD, I'm asking you to consider removal of this production from the field trip list and replacing it with something that these students can see and be encouraged by and be made proud of who they are and where they came from. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McKinney. Um, that will conclude our public comment for this evening. We will now recess and reconvene in the board conference room.
Okay. This, in accordance with the open meetings law, the board opened a meeting at 5.30 p.m. in the boardroom with a quorum present, recessed open session in the boardroom, and is now reconvened at 6.55 p.m. in open session in the board conference room with a quorum present. Just a note to my colleagues, uh, the app is not working properly, so uh, before you speak, if at all, you will, uh, ask you to press the button until it turns red. And then when you're done, to turn it off because the, the staff will not be able to turn on and turn off our microphones. So moving on to consent agenda items, do we have any questions concerning consent agenda items? CJ? Yes. Um, which one is this? Um, B2, um, the, yeah, page 21 or 20, 21. Is that the right one? Yeah. Sorry. Oops. Sorry. That's okay. I was just wondering. Um, it, that's not all the high schools. So is just why aren't all they participating? Or if the students at the high schools aren't listed, will they also get benefit of this? No, it should be all of our high schools. Um, and if we're missing one, it was a mis it was an error. But I think it is all there. Okay. Um, the one I'm thinking of is at Boulevard Heights. I know it's not a typical oh, high school, but I have seen, you know, Certainly. students yeah. in there. So would they at least have access to this? Yes. We'll make, we'll make sure they we'll do. We'll make sure okay. they do. Yes, ma'am. That was it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Can I follow up on that? Is Metro on that list? Let me check real quick and see if not. I'm uh, sorry, I don't, I don't. So traditionally what would happen there is if the student is at Metro, we will offer the, the exam okay. since they're still part of their traditional high school. Right. Okay, that's kind of what I was thinking. I yes. just want to make sure. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Other questions from the board on consent agenda? Looks like we have no more questions on consent agenda item from the board. So this concludes the discussion of agenda items. We will now recess for executive session in the board conference room. For executive session as authorized by Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code under Sections 551.071, 0 .071, 0 0.072, 0 0.074, and 0 0.076.
North ISD teachers. This year, we are looking for a few lead content teachers at each of our schools. Those of you who are interested in continuing to teach full time, but want to positively impact instruction for a greater number of students. The new lead content teacher initiative provides you an opportunity to do just that and receive a stipend. At elementary schools, we're looking for an early childhood literacy teacher, an intermediate literacy teacher, and an elementary math teacher. At our middle schools, we're looking for a literacy teacher and two math teachers. And at our high schools, we're looking for a teacher in each of our core content areas, literacy, math, science, and social studies. Lead content teachers, or LCTs, will participate in after-school professional learning delivered by Fort Worth ISD content teams. LCTs will then re-deliver this professional learning to other teachers on their campus. Lead content teachers will become the content expert on their campus. LCTs will be the teacher other teachers come to when there are questions about curriculum or instruction for their particular subject areas. Lead content teachers will receive an annual stipend of $3,000 payable upon completion of LCT requirements. You'll find additional opportunities and expectations in our application information. All teachers will receive an online application through district email. Please consider applying to become an LCT at your campus. Campus. In support of teachers, I'm Jerry Moore. Last year, our district received over $750,000 in grants from the United Way of Tarrant County to support childhood literacy programs and secondary initiatives that prepare students for college and careers. That's why we're making it possible and very convenient for you to donate online. Here's the thing, the amount isn't as important as having 100% participation from our employees. Online donation instructions were recently sent to your email from the United Way with a message from me. Search your inbox. Making an online contribution is simple and takes very little time to complete. It's so simple, I'm gonna do it right now, live. Well, live to video. First, find the email. Oh, here it is right there. Click on the link, decide how much you'd like to give and how. Then hit enter. That's it. We've got it. Our support for the United Way becomes support from the United Way. No matter the amount, your donation to the United Way of Tarrant County can make a difference. And doing it online is really easy. So now it's your turn. Thank you for giving. ISD is promoting college readiness in an even bigger way this year. We are competing in the FAFSA race to submit. Beginning October the 1st, every student who is planning to go to college or even thinking about going to college will want to be sure to fill out a FAFSA form. FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. It's the document that determines a student's eligibility for federal financial aid for college which may include grants, scholarships, work study, and loans. But it's not just about financial needs. And those opportunities for you as a student are quite remarkable. Completing the FAFSA should be top priority for every college-going student. You can't receive any college or university-sponsored scholarship money if you don't. What well, they're going to do is take the best scores of each section. And that's where the FAFSA Race to Submit comes in. The campuses with the highest percentage of increase in FAFSA completions will receive a recognition banner for their school. Your high school college coaches are available on your campus to help you complete the FAFSA. And we'll provide financial aid help sessions from October through May. Let the race to submit begin. school districts that are working to develop programs in conjunction with higher education and industry partners. Part of what we teach in here too is that you understand the best practices that the FAA recognizes. North Texas uh, Aero Robotics Program uh, received a grant to provide training, to provide curriculum, to provide drones for these 10 schools. I've got a pre-flight checklist that you'll get as well. In addition to that, we're going to go through a lot of things that are important.
important for teachers to know and understand as they're fielding drones to their classrooms. We'll kind of get the kids outside the classroom really hands-on with different new tools that they can use for law enforcement and other things that we've got planned for it. The FAA 107 program is a program where students can actually take the program in high school and test for the 107 uh, remote pilot certificates. These two motors will go slightly faster. They can use these drones to survey their animals and so I found that kind of interesting and that's how I'm going to incorporate into my classroom just talking about how we're using it in agriculture today. And then to make it go up, we just give it some throttle. If it loses signal for any reason, battery dies, something goes wrong with the drone, it loses a signal for any reason, it will go to 60 feet and then it's going to turn around and fly back to where it took off from and land itself. Not everyone who's going to work on a drone, put one together or fly one is going to end up uh, working in the drone industry, but it's a great way to teach them about technologies embedded inside them that make them perform the way they perform. Heart of America Technology Makeover, and it's sponsored by Calac. We receive new computers, a new Chrome cart with 30 Chromebooks. I think that is amazing because we get a new library. New walls, 3D printer. I saw the 3D printer, then I was wondering if the students will also be able to use it. New books, and we're just very excited about this opportunity to enhance the kids' learning and lives. The outcomes will far exceed the work we've done here today and serve generations to come. Our shirts say Cadillac Cares. For us to be able to give back in any way we can in our local communities, just try to make a difference in a young person's life. Industry-driven, Gold Seal programs and schools of choice offer Fort Worth ISD families and students the power of choice, now more than ever, to go beyond the basic, beyond the traditional, to find the pathway that's a match to a student's interest, goals, and learning style. And just look at the programs and schools to choose from. You've got goals and dreams for the future. We've got a high school experience to match. There you go. They can sign up. Monday. Fort Worth ISD Gold Seal programs of choice are built for dreamers like you. Can you do one simple The problem solvers, the curious minds, the creators of art and idea. Gold Seal programs deliver expert guidance, and your checklist, hands on learning, certifications, college credits, and community partners who support your learning. A great example, our P-TECH early college high schools that combine high school, college, and career. So the idea is to grow. Students can earn an associate degree. Ready to go. Visit job sites, build relationships, and develop workplace skills and knowledge. Our partners enrich every Gold Seal program, open doors to careers, and put you ahead of the herd. There's a gold seal pathway to fit your interest. Like so let's give it a shot. Whether it's making machines run better and fly higher. Sales inside up. Hey, the place is better. Or improving health. Do you have any allergies? And housing. Whether it's serving on the front lines. Are y'all set? All right, we're ready. Or protecting citizens online. Yeah, I'm moving on the frames. Bring your biggest dreams and determination here. Uh, really great product. Where you belong. In a Fort Worth ISD program of choice. Take graphic. Your choice. The atmosphere is electric at Fort Worth ISD Gold Seal Schools of Choice. It's like, it's like These smaller, well-focused learning communities prepare students for college and careers in the most innovative way. And this combines art and math. Now we know what to do. Every school day hums with activity and empowerment at Young Men's Leadership Academy and Young Women's Leadership Academy. Future leaders are at work here, gaining knowledge, experiences, and character while developing lifelong strategies for success. Them, you know it, all be them. Move toward your dreams at the IM Terrell Academy for STEM and VPA. On the STEM side, students design and problem solve in a high-tech makerspace. In VPA, students train in state-of-the-art studios and perform in a magnificent hall. The school's Cowan Academy in the Humanities elevates the study of literature, history, art, and philosophy. Imagine learning multiple languages, exploring global cultures, and taking academic courses in English and Spanish. 
The World Languages Institute is perfect for students from Spanish immersion and dual language programs, and anyone else eager to learn Spanish immersion style. Early college high schools merge high school, college, and career. And connect it all together. Students go to school on Tarrant County College campuses and can earn an associate degree for free. Marine Creek Collegiate High School focuses on high academic achievement and skills for success. It's got a slightly movable the joint. The Texas Academy of Biomedical Sciences is a hub of health science studies with hands-on laboratory learning supported by medical industry partners. TCC South Fort Worth ISD Collegiate High takes industry partnerships to a new level. It's the district's first P-TECH early college high school. Partners such as Encore and the Fort Worth Water Department help students build skills that industries want. Schools of choice are not just for older students. Collectively, four applied learning academies serve kindergarten through the eighth grade. Students apply their knowledge to solve real life issues as they investigate the bigger world. Our Montessori program guides kindergarten through eighth grade students in multi-age classrooms that are safe and respectful. Students work through lessons, interact with others, cultivate self-discipline, and take early ownership of their education. A great start to a lifetime of learning. One size fits all education is so last century. Pick your cutting edge gold seal pathway to college, career, and community leadership. wisd.org slash choice or call 817-814-1540. Thank you to all of you for joining us here at Carroll Peak Elementary. Today we celebrate the successful conclusion of Reed Fort Worth's classroom library campaign and the fact that more than 130,000 books have been delivered to Fort Worth ISD campuses by Reed Fort Worth and community volunteers. Catherine, what is the name of the book that you have today? Rambo. Catherine and her classmates will directly benefit from having these books in their classroom, as will every Fort Worth ISD student in every pre-kindergarten classroom through second grade across our city. So which book is your favorite? My friend is sad. Which book do you like? A little ducky with a cookie. I think for a community to succeed, you must have well-educated workforce. You want to share with everybody what your favorite book is? Three Billy Ghost Grove. Three Fort Worth is here to complement the dedicated and mission-driven elementary school teachers and leaders that work every day in our classrooms. So tell me about your favorite book. It's really funny. These books will have a deep impact on our children and will have a ripple effect across the city for years to come. What do you like about that book? Why is that a good book? Because the, the last part is my favorite one. The last part is your favorite one. Those books that end well are always good books. Don't you agree?
Okay, in accordance with the open meetings law, the board opened the meeting at 5.30 p.m. in the boardroom with the quorum present, recessed and reconvened open session in the board conference room, adjourned regular session, convened executive session, adjourned executive session, and is now reconvened open session at 7.43 p.m. in the boardroom with a quorum present. Uh, moving on to uh, agenda item number 15. Uh, do I have a motion? No items were pulled, by the way, so do I have a motion accepting consent agenda items? We have a motion by Trustee Jackson and a second by Trustee Luebanos. Do I have any discussion? Looks like we have no discussion. Please move the vote. Motion passes 7 4 and 0 against. So 16A is not necessary because we did not pull any items. Uh, there is no personnel appointments this evening, so we will move on to action agenda. 17A, 17B, 17C is not needed tonight. So we are moving on to 17D, which is approved the second reading of revisions to board policy CG local, CI local, CNA local, DBAA local, FJ local, and FMA local. Do I have a motion? Looks like I have a motion by Trustee Robbins and a second by Trustee Jackson. Do we have any discussion? Looks like we have no discussion. Please move the vote. Motion passes 7-4 and 0 against. 17, 17E was pulled and will be considered at a future board meeting. Uh, 17F will not be needed tonight. Uh, moving on to comments by board members or superintendent on current district activities and announcements. Do we have any comments? Trustee Evans. Thank you, President Ramos. I just wanted to say that I recently had the opportunity to tour Monag Middle School, and the great things that we heard about tonight with our parent volunteer, Brent Helmer, it's really just the tip of the iceberg. And Dr. Kirkpatrick is very proud of her campus and for good reason. And I'm appreciative, uh, appreciative of the opportunity to walk the campus and see the great things the kids are doing. Awesome. Thank you. Trustee Quentin Phillips. Thank you, President Ramos. Um, I just briefly wanted to mention that since our last board meeting, the last time we were all here together, um, our city had has really had a lot of unrest. Um, unfortunately, we lo we uh, lost a member of our community, our Tatiana Jefferson, and um, and far be it for me to politicize that death any further than what it already has been. But if nothing else, we just want to honor the life and legacy of that young lady. Um, and, and also offer to the city of Fort Worth, to which we are all citizens, that we see the unrest, we see the pain, and we too hurt. Um, another side of that is that there was a young man that was present that saw his family member taken away from him, eight years old, and we all know that it is unspeakable for anyone to have to experience that no matter what age you are. Um, but that young man is expected to go on and be a student, uh, to be a, a member of society, and uh, although many of us have overcome challenges, not many of us could compare it to the challenge that young man has ahead of him or that he's already experienced. So to that young man, I just want to say that um, we offer heartfelt condolences, but not only condolences, but actions of however we can help you to succeed, um, consider it done, that we make sure that, um, th that you have a fruitful life moving forward in the wake of unspeakable tragedy. So just wanted to briefly acknowledge um, both of those lives and pay honor in the proper way. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Trustee Phillips. Um, with that, um, I've got, looks like no other from the board. I do have three brief ones. One, I did uh, want to recognize not only Sherry Breed, our Chief of Equity and Excellence, but also the, um, uh, the, the Racial and Ethnic Equity <laughs> Committee, which is composed of students and educators, uh, community members, board members, uh, and, and so, uh, Courageous Conversations About Race recognized Fort Worth Independent School District Racial Equity Committee at a national conference in, in New Orleans uh, last week. And so, Ms. Breed, I want to thank you again for your tireless work. Uh, I want to thank the administrative team entirely for leaning into the Courageous Conversations protocol uh, and, and being able to be a shining example for this country uh, on topics of not only what Trustee Phillips just described, but what our realities uh, on us trying to undo this work. Um, second one is to note that Trustee Ashley Paz was not able to join us tonight because she uh, was on a flight to Council of the Great City Schools where she is representing our board, uh, our city, and our community. 
uh, in doing the work, which is completely connected to everything that we discussed tonight, student achievement, racial and ethnic equity, governance. Uh, and then the final one is to recognize and honor a dear friend of mine, uh, Virginia Jacobs, who is, by the way, the National School Board Association Chief of Equity Officer. And I had the privilege and the honor of serving under her leadership when she was the chair of CUBE, the Council of Urban Board of Education, uh, and then transitioned over to the chief role. And is joining us here in Fort Worth, Funky Town, Texas. Yes. Glad to have you here, my friend. Uh, with that, looks like we have no other comments uh, from the board, so this meeting is officially adjourned.